Grace and peace to you and Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer. We are redeemed for redemptive living. Now, what does that mean? You know, one of the things that, that we try to keep in mind, and we need to keep in mind in the church, is that as, as Christians, as church people, we have a specialized vocabulary. Churchy words that we use here that like whew, go right over the head of folks out there in this post-church environment. Sometimes they go over our own heads right in here. Atonement, propitiation, justification, sanctification, apocalyptic, eschatological. Even words like Savior, Trinity, expressions like blood of the Lamb. That goes like whew, right over people's heads outside the church. So we have to be careful when we use such words that we define them and uh, know what we're talking about. Because sometimes there are words that are just so rich in biblical meaning and significance and understanding who we are and what we are supposed to be. Some words are just so rich in that we've got to use them, but we have to define them. And we have such a word today, a whole family of words, redeem, redeemer, redemption, redemptive. So yeah, went ahead and put it in the title, Redeem for Redemptive Living. But it's important to understand what that word means so we better understand the blessing that God has called us to be. And again, we're continuing our, our look at who we are and what we are supposed to be about, this mission of God's people. God has his mission of bringing reconciliation and restoration to all his fallen creatures and creation. He calls us to partner with him, bearing his image. And we've been looking each week at what that means, specific ways in which God has invited us to be part of his mission. We've talked about how we are people who care for creation, the original mandate going back to Genesis 1 and 2. We talked about Abraham, the call and promise of Abraham, which we are heirs of, blessed to be a blessing. Perhaps an overused cliche, but one that beautifully describes who we are. Richly blessed to be a blessing to all peoples, in fact, all creation. And last week we focused on the ethical dimension of that, that we are people who are to walk in God's ways, and that our ethical, moral lives that we live are not just about following what God has said, obeying Him for the sake of obedience, although that's important in itself, but by living the ethical, moral life He's called us to walk in, we are being a blessing to this fallen, tragic world. So we looked at those. Today we're looking at this one that we are people who are redeemed for redemptive living. Another aspect on what it means to be a blessing and to live God's mission. So what does it mean? What's it about? Well, I'm focusing on the word redeem. The rede redeem is a word that God uses to describe what he's going to do in the Exodus. And that's the part of the Bible we're focusing on today, the Exodus of, of the people of Israel from Egypt. This is what God said in Exodus 6 when he was laying out for Moses what he's going to do. He said, therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I'll bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I'll free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with mighty acts of judgment. He says, I'm going to redeem you. Well, what's that mean? But afterwards, after the Red Sea, Moses and his sister Miriam were leading the people and singing, dancing, rejoicing before the Lord. That was the psalm we read together, part of it. In verse 13, they say this, In your unfailing love you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength you will guide them into your holy dwelling. They're saying, God, you redeemed us. It came up in the Deuteronomy passage as well, but we'll get to that in a minute. So this incident is about being redeemed. Let's define it. The word that translated redeem, a little more Hebrew for you here, is the word goel, which is a com was a common word for the Hebrew people. A word from everyday life. A word from family life. It's about family and activity in a family. 
A goel or redeemer is like a, a family champion who will do whatever it takes for the family when they are threatened or when they are in need. Uh, sometimes the word's translated kinsman redeemer to bring out this, this family sense. So there's a number of ways in which it shows up in the Bible and is used in this everyday sense. Not applied to God necessarily, but this is how the, the word, the redeemer, the goel, figured in the life of the people. One way is if there is a murder, if there's a murder, the goel, the kinsman redeemer, would seek out the perpetrator to bring them to justice. Now that's not, I'm not talking about a Sicilian vendetta kind of thing. It's not that. But it's to bring justice where there's been injustice. When a family has suffered because of injustice, to the point of loss of life, someone takes on the role of Goel to seek to bring justice. That's the Redeemer. Another way is helping a family member when they are in crushing debt or have lost their land or, or slave, have gone into slavery. Then a family member acting as Goel, kinsman redeemer, pays off the debt, buys them back from slavery. Or if the land has, they've lost their land, the Goel will go and buy the land to keep it in the family. And that comes up in the Bible, especially in the book of, book of Ruth. And then a third way, and this one it's a practice that was actually not, not uncommon in antiquity, but it seems really weird to us today. But I'll explain it, because it does have a significance here. Let's say a man and a woman were married. They got married, but before they had any sons, okay, in that society, the sons were the ones who inherited. So before they had any sons, the man dies. Well, then it is incumbent upon one of his brothers, if he has brothers, one of his brothers, to act as Goel, kinsman redeemer, and marry the widow. Now, if he is already married, too bad. Polygamy wasn't a problem. Married the widow. And then the, the Goel brother and the widow, if they had a son, that son would be considered the son of the deceased brother. And so inheritance goes to that son, the family name goes through him. It's a way of keeping the family name, the inheritance, the property all within the family. Now, it seems really weird to us today, but once again, it's a family kinsman redeemer seeking to, to preserve the family, to preserve its name, preserve its property. Okay, that's how the word's used. It was a regular word used to describe family, legal, civil life. So when God says, I'm going to redeem you, and afterwards, Moses and Miriam and leading people dancing and saying, God, you redeemed us. And in Deuteronomy 15, when God says, hey, I'm giving you these commands because I redeemed you. What does it mean? Well, were the people of Israel, had there been murder and injustice? Well, yes. Pharaoh, the Egyptians, full-on genocide was going on. God says, I'll be your kinsman redeemer. I'll bring justice. Had they lost land, had no land, were they in slavery or crushing debt? They had nothing. They were slaves, landless. Even though God had promised them a land, they had nothing. They were enslaved. God says, I'll be your goel, kinsman redeemer. I'll bring you out of slavery and give you a land. Is there a concern about the next generation passing it on? Well, yes. By Pharaoh's decree, they were killing all the sons. Pharaoh's intent was extermination of the entire people of Israel through cutting off any descendants completely. And God says, I'll be your Goel, your kinsman redeemer. I'll make you my sons. And the family will go on. And that's what he did. That's what God did. He acted as Goel, redeemer, family champion, adopting these people as his own, acting in this family way 
He brings judgment upon the murderers, upon Pharaoh in Egypt through the, 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 the plagues and through God's judgment at the Red Sea. He brought judgment on them. Not vendetta, justice. He rescued them from slavery, doing it all himself. Complete act of grace, completely God doing this. Israel contributed nothing. God did it all in rescuing them, bringing them out, and giving them the promised land. And he adopted them as his own. He claimed the firstborn. It's a little more complicated than we're going to get into today, but he claimed the firstborn of every family as his own, fulfilling once again being Goel, kinsman, redeemer. Why did God do this? Why did he do it? He lays it out in Exodus 1 and 2. On the one hand, he did it because of his great compassion for the people. Last week, if you are here last week, I talked about the outcry. God responding to the outcry. That's what he did. The people were crying out in their oppression, in their slavery, and in the murder and the genocide they were facing. God, they cried out to God. He had compassion on them. God always responds. His heart goes to the outcry of those being oppressed. That's one reason. The other is because of God's faithfulness to what he had promised Abraham. He had called Abraham. He had given him a promise. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you to be a blessing to all the world. God's going to keep that promise. So he needed to step in. The promise is in danger. Somebody's trying to exterminate the family. Somebody's enslaving the family. Kinsman Redeemer rises up and says, hey, we got to get this blessing going. I'll be Kinsman Redeemer. I'll redeem you. And he did. So it was his compassion as well as his faithfulness to his promise and the call to be a blessing. Now, what's fascinating is what this means for how the people are to live. And we talked about last week, walking in God's ways, that ethical moral. But there's more to it than that that come out in the laws uh, that are in Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus, a whole lot of them. We had just that sample from Deuteronomy 15, in which God says to, I should have put this up on the screen, God says, remember you are slaves in Egypt and I redeemed you, that's why I'm giving you these commands. You see, what God redeemed them with an Exodus-shaped redemption, and so then he calls them to live that out in a similar way, to do in the world around them, to be a blessing by acting the same way he did. There are some examples in this Deuteronomy 15 and other places in the Old Testament. For instance, releasing slaves. They were not to hold slaves indefinitely. They were to release them every six years. They were to set them free because why? They had been slaves, and so they were to be released. Debts canceled. Debts would be canceled because they had been impoverished and God rescued them and enriched them. They would cancel debts. Wouldn't that be nice? Like every seven years, all your debts go away? It was a ref- that wasn't just an arbitrary law. It was a reflection of the redemption they had received. The poor cared for. Why? Because they had been poor. They had nothing. And so they were to look upon the poor, open-handed, the text said, generous, not grudging, lending freely, even if it's in the sixth year before having to cancel all debts. Because that's how God treated them. Aliens, foreigners, welcomed. There were some distinctions in how people were treated, but they were welcomed and there was justice and compassion for them. Why? Because they were aliens and foreigners in Egypt. And so they were to pass that on. That's redemptive living. The redemption they had received was to be reflected in how they treated other people. It passes through them. And then the generosity that came out strongly in that Deuteronomy passage. God had been generous to them. He had blessed them. He was enriching them. He was going to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. So they were to be generous in caring for the poor and in worshiping their God. They were redeemed by their kinsman, Redeemer Goel, to be a blessing. How to be a blessing? Redemptive living, passing on what God had given to them. Now, we are 
children of the Exodus. This is our story. I made that, made that point. I'm going to keep making that point. We are the people of Israel spiritually. This is our story of being redeemed from Egypt, in Egypt. It's our people. God has done it for us. We are part of that family spiritually. All those who are in Christ are Abraham's heirs. But we are also heirs of another exodus, a greater exodus, if you will, that the first one pointed to and was a preview of, and that is the exodus that we have in Jesus, the Goel, the kinsman redeemer for the whole human race. In fact, in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus is in the transfiguration, he's talking with Moses and Elijah, the word Sometimes in the Bible they, they translate it as his departure. He was, he, the word that Luke uses is exodus. That Jesus was talking about his exodus with Moses, the leader of the first exodus. That's what Jesus was doing. Exodus. He was going to be kinsman redeemer. Were we facing, was there a murderer who needed to be brought to justice? Yes. The entire human race. Genocide. Because of Satan and the sin he has led us into, under the threat and curse of death. Nobody gets out of this life alive. Death. Satan is the author of murder. We are under the slavery to a fallen creation and the futility and insignificance that it brings. We need a Redeemer. And so Jesus acted as our goel, our redeemer for us. That's the cross. That's what he did. The redeemer goel does whatever it takes to provide restoration for the family. And that's what Jesus did. Giving himself completely to rescue us from slavery. And Jesus used that as words freely in his teaching. Being slaves to sin and being set free in him redemption. He did it to give us a land, the new heavens and the new earth, the kingdom. Not just a piece of real estate in the Middle East, but the whole new creation is ours in him. He has freed us from slavery. He has given us himself and given us inheritance, new life, eternal life. This is a redemption that is, is like infinitely beyond any way the word is used in the Old Testament. That's what we have. Now, what does it mean then for how we live, how we are to be a blessing? In the same way, why did Jesus do it? His compassion for us, but also to call us to be a blessing to the nations. The same call of Abraham is still in force today. What does it mean? Well, in the original, in the Exodus... Some of the specific things of redemptive living don't compute for us today because we are not a nation like the people of Israel were. So some of the stuff about debts and slavery doesn't carry over directly into our lives. But not to worry, the New Testament is full of expressions of redemptive living. And redemptive living is this. The cross for us becomes the shape of our lives and how we live. The cross is not just what we have received, redemption. The cross becomes the shape of how I interact with the world, redemptive living. Here are a few verses that will flesh this out. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. We have received mercy. We share mercy. Our basic attitude towards the world and other peoples is to be merciful. I think it's one of the, the tragic, tragic shame that of too many Christians in the Christian church out in the unchurched world has this reputation of being judgmental, condemning, and accusatory. How did we do that? Merciful. We're called to be merciful. The cross seen in our merciful, compassionate, gracious attitude toward others. Or to even put it more broadly, John 15, 12, Jesus says, love each other as I have loved you. What we have received becomes the shape of how we live. 
Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The forgiveness we receive becomes the forgiveness we give. A Christian who holds grudges, (laughs) what is that? Should not be, cannot be. That's a Christian who doesn't get the cross. That's Jesus' point in our gospel today, in the unforgiving servant. Our attitude is forgiveness, forgiveness, graciousness to all. Romans 15, 7, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. What the cross has given me, so I give to others. That's redemptive living. It affects our generosity, as we saw in Deuteronomy 15. It affects us still today. 2 Corinthians 8. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. We are generous because we have generously received. That is redemptive living. We give generously, whether it's to those in need or to mission or to the congregation, not because of just obedience to a law about tithing, because that's the cross. We have received, so we give. The cross is shaping our lives and shaping our hearts so that our lives become a very picture of the redemption we have received. 1 John 3, 16, 17, this was our epistle today. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can love of God be in that person? John's asking the same question I just asked about holding grudges and resentment. Like, how can that be? How can love of God be in such a person? How can love of God be in such a person who is not helping those in need? Redemption, redemptive living, we have received so we give. That's the shape of our lives. And Jesus put it right smack dab in the middle of the pattern of prayer that he gave us. I'll give you both both different translations. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors, or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He turned it into a prayer in which it's kind of turned on its head and say, God, treat me the way I'm treating others. Now the real flow is we treat others the way God has treated us. Jesus turned it around, made it a prayer to really remind us whenever we pray, because we're to pray this every day as a pattern to prayer, that every day we live in forgiveness. Every day we live in the cross. Every day redemptive living. Every day I'm, I'm walking around in my mind, I'm going, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. Mercy, love, acceptance. See, it's all about the cross. It's all about the cross. The cross for us becomes the cross through us. The cross for us becomes the shape of my life. I am redeemed. I live redemptively. What Christ has given me, I give to others. And so my life becomes a picture of his life. And that way, I'm a blessing. I'm a blessing then. And the blessing to Abraham The blessing to God's people over the centuries, the blessing through Jesus and the cross and resurrection comes flowing through my life, through your life, as we live redemptively, the cross for us. So, yeah, it is a technical churchy word. Redeem, redeemer, redemption, redemptive. But so rich in meaning in describing the the very shape of our lives, pointing us to the redemption we have in Christ, And then pointing us into the world and saying, live this way by my strength, for my glory, for my mission. Amen. Let's stand for prayer.